Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ARC's Fireside Chat. Uh, today, we're going to just get right into it. Uh, this is a continuation from last week, where we began to explore what does mass incarceration and extreme sentencing uh, actually do and how it impacts family separation, especially young people who have parents that are incarcerated, often called uh, uh, the voiceless, because in our country, we don't stop and consider how uh, incarceration, especially mass incarceration, actually impacts our children, our next generation, the next leaders of our countries. Uh, so I uh, want to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Sam Lewis. I'm the executive director of ARC, the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. And last week, we had uh, three organizations, three amazing organizations that work with uh, youth that have uh, parents that are incarcerated. So we had developing despite distance from uh, Detroit, Michigan. We had daughters behind incar beyond incarceration from New Orleans, Louisiana, and Place for Grace from uh, Los Angeles, California. Uh, all three of these organizations work with children that have incarcerated parents and do amazing work. So I just want to get right into it uh, in order to give uh, these young people an opportunity to really be able to share uh, what it's like to be uh, or to have a, 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 a parent that's incarcerated. Um, so uh, I'd like to start with uh, uh, Tiffany, Tiffany Brown from uh, Developing Despite uh, Distance. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your organization uh, and of course, the introduction of one of our special guests? Sure, thanks for having us again, Sam. Um, my name is Tiffany Brown. In 2016, I founded Developing Despite Distance. Uh, it's an organization uh, based in Detroit, Michigan. It supports young men that have incarcerated parents. Um, my, what drives my passion for this work is my personal experience with parental incarceration. Uh, when I was a teen, my mother was incarcerated in federal prison for almost three and a half years. And so I know firsthand the impacts that parental incarceration has on young people and families. Um, but I'm really excited to have joining me today, uh, Dewan, Dewan Bradley. Uh, he has been with Developing Despite Distance um, since 2017. He joined our program when he was a ninth grader. Uh, and at the time, both of his parents were incarcerated. Both his mother and father were incarcerated, but he was rocking it with a 4.0 um, and just amazed me and has continued to amaze me over the years. Uh, Dewan is currently a senior at uh, Mumford High School in Detroit, a high school I graduated from. Um, and so I'll, yeah, and I'll, I'll let him introduce himself. His father is currently still incarcerated, uh, but, but since then, his mother has returned home. Hey, Dewan, go on and introduce yourself. How you doing? Welcome to the show. Um, please introduce yourself. Um, hello, all. My name is Dewan Bradley. Um, and I joined Miss Tiffany um, back in 2017 when my mom and dad was in jail. So it was really, really, really hard trying to deal with that, plus keep my grades up, plus worry about what's going on at home. And you know what I'm saying? Trying to be out here just living and trying to help me and my siblings, you know what I'm saying, survive. So it, it was kind of hard. It was kind of hard for all of us because my mom didn't know, you know what I'm saying, how long she was going to be gone and, you know, so what we was going to do because we had nobody to help us, you know what I'm saying? But we got through that and then turns out when my mom come home, well, not turns out, but as my mom came home, my dad's still there. He has like three to five more years to go. So it is still hard, you know what I'm saying, dealing with him and plus that they were just both going together. It still affects me in every way. Hey, thank you, Dewan. Uh, just so you know, we're here with you. We're here for you too, little bro, okay? Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, from uh, Daughters Beyond Incarceration, we have Dominique Johnson. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? How are you doing? Uh, and tell us a little bit about, about your organization. And of course, uh, introduce uh, our special guest from Daughters Beyond Incarceration. Hello, everyone. My name is Dominique Johnson. I am a 37 year old child of an incarcerated parent. My father is currently on serving a life sentence in Angola. Um, I am also the founder and executive director of Daughters Beyond Incarceration. And I have two of my amazing youth advocates here, um, Sunshine Matthew and Casey Thornton. Casey is a student at one of the best high schools in New Orleans, Warren Easton. <laughs> and Sunshine <laughs> is a recent graduate of Chalmette High School. She was one of our girls to graduate at the age of 62. So, so Casey, are you there? Yes. Want to go ahead, go ahead and introduce yourself. How are you? 
Uh, and, and please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Casey Thornton. Uh, of course, I go to Warren Easton. I am about to be a senior. Um, I've been with Daughters Beyond Incarceration for uh, a minute now, like a little while. And I really like speaking like about me and my father and how I feel. Like it really helped me a lot. And then uh, Ms. Dominique and Ms. Bree also helped me with a lot. Thank you so much, Casey. Uh, Sunshine, are you there? Yeah. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Sunshine Matthew. I'm 17 years old. Um, I joined DBI a little while back, and they helped me like really express how I really felt. Like before, it was like. When people used to ask me, do it bother me? It really wasn't. I used to say, no, it don't bother me. But once I met them and I actually started like talking about it and speaking about it, I realized how much it actually do bother me and affect me and how traumatizing it is to grow up with a parent that's incarcerated. Hey, thank you, Sunshine. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Know that we're, we're here for you and with you always. Uh, our next guest in, in organization is Karen McDaniels, a play, the executive director and, and founder of Place for Grace, another amazing organization. Uh, Karen uh, has a, a special guest. Uh, Karen, how are you doing? And could you tell us a little bit about your organization? And of course, introduce your special guest, please. Sure, thanks for having us back, Sam. We're really excited to be here. Um, the Place for Grace started in 2009. So we're a little more than 10 years old now. And we go into California prisons to provide space for children and families simply to be together um, and reduce the impact of, of the trauma of parental incarceration. So that's what we do here in California. We run camps and we run a literacy program. And I have an extremely special guest who has me all in my feelings this morning. I've cried eight times so far. Um, and this is my son, James McDaniel. So I'll let him introduce himself. Hey, James, how you doing, man? Introduce yourself, welcome, and how are you doing? I'm doing all right. And hello, everyone. My name is James McDaniel. I'm 15 years old, and I go to Heritage High School. And uh, um, I don't know. <sighs> So, so, so just, just so you know, uh, as I said before, we went on the air, like this is a conversation, but this is also to empower your voices. Uh, so, so from each of your perspectives, if, if you'd like to share, uh, uh, like looking at, we're, we're in, in three different states, uh, Louisiana, Michigan, and California. But the thing that, that we all have in common uh, is, is this mass incarceration beast, as I call it. And uh COVID-19 right now, so, so what is that like from your perspective at, 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 as a, a young person who has a parent uh, that's currently incarcerated uh, with COVID-19 going on right now? Uh, each of you, please share, share just if, if you like. I'll go first. Uh, um, sorry, can you repeat what you want us to um, say? So, so what is it, like your experience right now uh, with COVID-19 uh, uh, happening across our country and, and, and across the world. Uh, what is that like for you as a young person with having a parent that's incarcerated? Okay. So, so go ahead, Sunshine, you, you were about to speak. Yeah, um, it's really hard. Like, it's already hard with them being incarcerated, but it's like, it's like extremely hard because now we don't get as many phone calls. We, is no visitation going on. So it's like, okay, I already have to go without seeing my dad, but now it's like, not permanent, but as of right now, it's permanent. Like, it's no way I could see him, no way possible. Like, no way at all. So it's like, yeah, a call, a call might be useful, but, no, it's nothing like 
seeing them, like touching them, is really, really like, if I want to say certain things, certain things I don't want to say over the phone because they listen to our whole conversation. And it's just like some things are personal. It's not for everybody to hear or everybody to understand. Like I was saying before on the last um, chat, some things I don't even want like my aunt or my mom or anyone listening to when I want to talk to my dad. So it's like, I don't, I feel like there's no privacy. It's already no privacy, but it's really no privacy. Like there's no way possible for us to actually sit down and have that one-on-one -on -one talk. It's nothing like a one-on-one -on -one in person. Thank you, Sunshine. Um, and I can really piggyback off that because it, it, it's, it's, it's most definitely extremely hard because it's not even about me not being able to see them, it's about what's going on in there with them. You know what I'm saying? I can't see them on top of all the health issues that's going on in them that, you know what I'm saying, that we might not be able to see them again because it's, it's stuff out here that, that's making us take pre, pre precautions, whatever, how you say that. Uh, you know what I'm saying? That we have to stay like six feet apart and, you know what I'm saying, wash our hands and keep masks on. But how do we even know that that's going on there in there for them? You know what I'm saying? So it's also like, I'm already upset that he's gone and he's been gone for so long. But also on top of that, it's the living condition that they're in. You know what I'm saying? So. Mm. Thank you, Can I go now? Yes, yes, please go ahead, Casey. Um, I feel like, um, I feel like I don't trust Angola. That's the prison that my father is in. I don't trust them because of past situations, like with my father. Um, he once, not too long ago, like two months ago, um, broke his hand and they was refusing surgery and stuff. And so now it's like, they have a virus and they have people around him that have it that's positive. And then if he broke his arm and that's that's extremely bad and they have a virus going on, how am I supposed to know they don't take care of him? Like we have to call Angola so many times to complain for him to get surgery on his hand. So how am I supposed to know that he's okay and he's safe, that he's not sick and he don't have the virus? Like it it bothers me a lot. Like I spend a lot of time crying and thinking about it. And then I don't always get to talk to him every day. So it's like, I know he gonna tell me the truth, but I don't always get to talk to him. So then many times I have to call them and they act like they don't care. So it's really hard. Like It hurts a lot. Um, Thank you, Casey. I was gonna just go off of that. And then plus on top of, they're not already telling us what's going on in there. It's about, you know what I'm saying? When they are calling us to tell us what's going on in there, we can't get to that because we're trying to catch up on what's going on out here. You know what I'm saying? If we can't really talk about, oh, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Okay, for instance, her dad broke his arm. You know what I'm saying? But how are we going to get to that? Because I'm telling him that I didn't got accepted into this and I'm doing this out here, and we can't even talk about the bad stuff that's going on in there. So how do I, how do I really even know if he's really actually okay? Thank you, Duan. Uh, James, is there anything you'd like to share? Um, I don't know if you guys are right. It is very, very difficult. Difficult. Uh, this whole pandemic thing is stressful. Um, he's only been, my dad has only been calling every other day. And most, like, the past, like, three days, he hasn't actually, he hasn't called at all, which is extremely stressful for me. And um, my mom told me about two weeks ago about uh, his building. His building got uh, quarantined. Like the, it was that building was first to be quarantined in what was it, California? And that like put a, a lot of stress on me. And I've been like really stressing about it, and it just sucks. Thank you, James. Uh, so, so in terms, so, so uh, Dominique, uh, Karen, and Tiffany, in terms of, of both the support that you give uh, as organizations, and, and I kind of want to jump ahead a little bit on, on, on one piece, like what other things can people that are listening do to support 
uh, the young people that have uh, uh, parents that are incarcerated. So could each of you share uh, something that, that uh, people that are listening to can do to support uh, young people who have parents that are incarcerated? Um, I, 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 my, uh, my strongest opinion is to most definitely keep on encouraging them that it's really going to be okay. You know what I'm saying? Keep on making sure you talking to them about how they are feeling because really before I met Miss Brown, I was not talking about it. It, it. it did not come up as a conversation. It did not come up as cool. It did not come up as, you know what I'm saying? Just, just coming up or if it was to come up, it probably was a joke or something like that. It was not being talked about. So what I encourage others to do is most definitely talk about it because you see how today everybody is saying they're feeling some type of way about their parents not getting everything that they need in jail or how they're even feeling that they're even going away from them. So I feel like if you're talking about it, it's making me feel better. So maybe it might make you. And I want to piggyback on that. I think that that's powerful what Duane said and it's, it's not so complex, right? It's like hold space just hold space for these young people during this time, right? If you look at all of our faces on this call today, you can see the feeling without a word, right? So hold space to go deeper and be a resource and just be a support to be a listening ear. Um, I, we understand that you might get notification about what's going on in, in the facility, right? And that might cause you some anxiety or you might not have received any notification at all. So just touching base with the young people who are impacted by this right now, I think is just one of the biggest things that we can do is just just being available, making ourselves available. And, and Tiffany, while while we have you there, could you could you recap? We got us now and the four demands that we got us now have. Tell us a little bit about we got us now and the four demands that we got us now are, are asking uh, on behalf of, of children uh, with incarcerated parents. Absolutely. So. You know, the three organizations that are represented here today, um, Place for Grace, Daughters Beyond Incarceration and Developing Despite Distance are all direct service programs, meaning we directly work with children that have incarcerated parents. Um, we Got Us Now is unique in that it's the only national organization that is dedicated to children of incarcerated parents. Um, their mission is to really amplify uh, the voices of children of incarcerated parents um, and to support direct service providers like us. Um, and to amplify our messaging. So I'm grateful to be a part of the 2020 Actionist Leadership Cohort. Um, I represent the state of Michigan. But aside from that, um, just across the board as it relates to children of incarcerated parents, um, we have four demands. And we really feel like we're not missing anything as it relates to these four demands, that this fully encompasses all of the concerns that children of incarcerated parents have about their parents during this global pandemic. So the first is, uh, a call for immediate clemency for elder and sickly parents in prison. We know that the research shows that uh, individuals age out of crime, so we, would, we are asking for that. Um, second is free communications. Families shouldn't have to pay for calls during this time. We understand that, you know, this, this pandemic has impacted our economy. People are being laid off. People are out of work. This has shifted the financial landscape of families. So, it's, it's not the individuals that are incarcerated that pay for these calls, it's the families. It takes away from children. Um, and so we are asking that all communication be free during this time. Um, in addition to that, the notification system, right? Like Casey mentioned, she shouldn't have to call Angola to get information and acquire and advocate. We should, there should be a free mobile notification system where we are getting regular consistent alerts about what's going on in each facility. Um, with the number of reports, how they're quarantining, what resources they're putting in place to ensure that they're protecting our parents. Um, and then the final is the safe and sanitary measures, that there should be free medical care, no copays co should be waived during this time, and that there really should be a guarantee that our parents have access to soap, face masks, hygiene products, cleaning products to clean their living quarters, and that, that the things that we're pushing for on the outside are things that we're guaranteeing that they have access to during this time. Uh, thank you, Tiffany, so much. So, so again, uh, could you put that back up on the screen, please? Uh, so, so again, we want to go over these things because this is not just uh, for, for one or just our three states. We're literally asking for this nationally. If you think in terms of, one, the demand for, for clemency for, for elderly uh, uh, and sickly parents in prison. So 65 and over, older, 
uh, is, is one, of the, one of the groups that uh, can, can, can definitely, and has been in, in many of the instances of deaths across the nation, uh, been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, this is also an age group that, that uh, all of the science and research shows that basically uh, phases out of any criminalistic uh, behavior. So uh, we think that this is both reasonable and, and, and necessary. Free communications. Uh, in California, I know that they're doing two days of communications, uh, free free phone calls two days a week, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Karen, is, is two days a week. It no, should it's, be three. It's, it's three in California. It's Tuesday through Thursday. Um, and that is only, um, was only for the month of April. So that has ended as of now. And so um, that is something that, that is really important. When you ask what are things that people can be doing right now to be supporting children like you see um, today, um, we don't have free communication as it stands. Um, so some companies have stepped up, but as of now, no, the free calls ended um, yesterday. So, so now we're in the month of May, and this is a demand. And when we say demand, for the people that are listening, for the people that are on the panel, and I will definitely myself be making phone calls out as I've been since this started, asking our state representatives and, and our officials in the departments of corrections across the United States to make these calls free. Uh, our children should be able to talk to their parents that are incarcerated. Uh, we, we demand that elderly people that are currently incarcerated uh, and sickly parents in prison uh, be given clemency uh, and a notification system. Uh, uh, I, I will say that the California Department of Corrections every night sends out an email notifying uh, everyone uh, and, and we post it on social media of what's going on inside uh, the institutions across the state. This is something that should be copied across the, the nation so that people can simply get on the internet or, or receive an email to get updates of what's going on throughout the system, uh, especially like, and we're talking about children, like these are young people who have parents and they wanna know that their parents are right. And this is not something that, I don't think it's something that should be politicized or negotiated. This is just something that simply needs to be done, period. Um, and, and when we take into uh, consideration other things, like I'd like to hear from, from anybody on the panel, like, what else should, get, for a moment, just think, what else should change in our system? Uh, if, if you were the person that had the power to be able to change it, what else should change? What, what else should change? Always keeping in mind that, one, we want to make sure our communities remain safe, but also we want a more humane system for our family members that are incarcerated. I'd like to say on that. Um, I think when you think about change, you should think about the people that are impacted and affected by that change. What most people forget is to include those people in the conversation. So for example, us, there's so many things that's happening in New Orleans specifically about children of incarcerated parents that we're not even considered on or we're not even brought to the table or sometimes when the decisions are made, we're not even thought about. So it's like people who aren't the grassroots organizations working on the problem are there trying to solve it but not including us in it when they're making these decisions or these changes. And so our specific voices aren't heard. So I think when, when you're considering about what's better for the community, what our system needs to do to be, to be better is to include us at the table. Don't think that just because they're 16 or they're 13 as well that they don't have a voice because they do. Yes, Dominique, I want to piggyback just off of that for our viewers who weren't at last week's call and just to make the connection between the statistics. So we understand mass incarceration um, and that there are 2.4 million individuals incarcerated in our country right now, but there are 2.7 million children with a parent that's currently incarcerated. So more children in our country have a parent that's incarcerated than we actually have incarcerated individuals. I just wanted to put a number with that because when we're talking about criminal reform, justice reform, um, and all of that work, our voices matter. Those 2.7 million voices matter. Absolutely. Right, and, and just to have a frame of reference, right, that's 2.7 million children with a parent right now. 14 million children will be affected in their lifetime by parental incarceration. So we're talking about astronomical numbers and astronomical trauma, right? And so specifically, I want to I want to go back to communication. Um, what we know is that there 
there is the ability for there to be free phone calls, right? It was shown by GTL here in California for the month of April for the days that they gave it. Um, there is capacity for there to be video conferencing for children and their parents. We know that that is a possibility. So at this point, we demand that. We demand it now and we demand it after COVID-19, right? That is something that, that, that is the right, fundamental right of every child that has an incarcerated parent is to communicate with their parent, to see, hold, touch their parent. Um, and so many states have adopted the children's um, rights of uh, children of incarcerated parents uh, bill of rights, but many states have not in fact um, put teeth into that bill of rights, right? They haven't ensured that children can actually have access to their parents. Um, so although we think it's lovely that there have been tokens given by some of these predatory companies that prey on our families, um, we're not satisfied with the tokens. We want free phone calls. We want video access for our families. And I would even go so far as to say we want free transportation to institutions um, for our children across the country. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so, so I'd like to uh, go speak specifically to uh, take a few minutes for each uh, uh, person. And Tiffany and Dom, could you? In, in regards to family separation, can you tell us a little bit more about what your organization does? Uh, how, how uh, like, what, how does it operate, and what is, what does it do for for people, young people like Dom and Dom? Uh, share what it's been like for you, uh, and how it's helped you. You want me to go first, Dom? I'll go first. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um. So, developing despite distance. Um. We are, we kind of have like two different parts to our program. So one part of it is like the direct part that our young people attend. Uh, we have a Saturday group where they write letters to their incarcerated parents. We go on field trips to build community amongst this population of young people because like DeWan mentioned, oftentimes you're suffering in silence. I, I don't think at any point, like in my life, anybody asked if I was being impacted by parental incarceration. And so we understand that we're not really asking in the schools and on the sports teams and things like that. So we really just want to do a lot of community building so that young people realize that they're not alone. Um, and so we also have a social emotional learning component to our curriculum. Um, group counseling is another layer as well because we understand the need to hold space for our young people. And then we support uh, the visits to, uh, to the prisons for our young people to see their incarcerated parents, both in state and out of state. We've been um, blessed enough to be able to send some of our young people to New York, to Tennessee to see their uh, incarcerated parents who are um, incarcerated in federal prisons. We understand that that kind of creates really big distances, but then we also uh, pay for the prison visits locally for our families as well. So we really just wanna be a bridge between the families and the young people and to be a support for the caregivers um, and a support for the young people. Thank you so much, Dom. So, so wait a minute, Dom. Uh, uh, as I recall, there's some celebration due on your end, although we, we haven't been able to like because of COVID, we can't officially, officially celebrate. But what new thing just transpired with you as you moving forward in your life? I just gave birth to twins. I had twins. I had, um, oh, oh. And my daughter, her name is Justice Charlie. So, and that is for Justice for Charlie. My dad's name is Charlie. And um, my son's name is Jamar Jr. Um, and they are actually sleeping right now, um, which is a good thing. But that was an extremely difficult transition because I never thought about being a nonprofit leader um, with over 60 girls in the program and being pregnant while doing so. So it was rough, but we did it. Um, we made it through. And, you know, that's one of the things that I love about CBI because as you saw, Sunshine Mama came up and introduced herself. She was one of the mothers that said, hey, if you ever need a hand, I'm always here, which is the same as Bree's mom and so many other moms have always reached out to us, which is what DVI is. DVI, we're a family. And we take on family responsibility and family roles. And our caregivers, they call us before they feel the need to punish their girls or um, do take whatever disciplinary measures, but they call us first to say, hey, this is what's going on. I need your help. And how can you help me? In addition to that, we also teach our girls youth development. 
in the beginning of March, we had um, another Black-led female organization come by to teach our girls public speaking training because we were actually preparing to go speak at the state capitol on our bills that we have that are, um, one of them we actually just got word will be heard on Wednesday, which is a task force that's gonna be built by and led by children of incarcerated parents. The other bill focuses on eliminating fees surrounding by prison calls. And so we're so excited because when we released that in October of 2019, we never thought about COVID-19 happening. So we were just preparing these girls to go speak for the first time in front of state legislators. Um, and in addition to so many other things that we do, we work with these girls on tutoring, um, restorative healing, um, building a relationship with your father while he's incarcerated. So we really focus a lot on parenting from prison. Um, and what's more important is that we keep the fathers that are currently incarcerated involved, as well as the ones that are, that are formerly incarcerated. Um, you guys know Bree's dad and my dad were extremely close when they were, when he was incarcerated. But my dad also knows Sunshine's dad. He also knows Casey's dad. And if there's anything going on that I need to reach out to him to kind of put to to them, he will do that for us because he's kind of working with us to make this organization grow and thrive. Dominique, so, so, the, so that the listeners know, how long has your father been incarcerated? My father was arrested when he was 21 years old. He was mistakenly identified as a guy that's six feet tall, over 200 pounds. He is roughly 5'8", maybe 185 pounds. And he has now been incarcerated for 37 years. And I am currently 37 years old. So, so when we think in terms of, so, so I'm hoping the audience is following. Uh, we have our young uh, uh, panelists that are here, our young guests. Who, who are still teenagers. And, and then we have Dominique, who spent her entire life with her dad being incarcerated. Uh, uh, my daughter spent her entire life, uh, or up to 24 years, she was born a month after I was released. And I understand the impact that it has had on her. Uh, can you share briefly, Dominique, if, if, if you like, like, what has it been like for you to grow up without your dad being present physically? Uh, and then like, even like, like now he has grandchildren, twins. Like what, what is that like, right? He has four grandchildren. You know, growing up, I was extremely belligerent. I mean, I was a fighter. Um, I was always told that my father was this ax murderer. He was this habitual killer. And you know, so anytime somebody asked me, hey, are you Charlie's daughter? I would run because I didn't know in what capacity you knew him. And I didn't know if you wanted to do me something because of what you, my daddy did to you. Um, and the very first time that I saw him outside of prison, it was at his father's funeral, and he was shackled in chains like a caged animal. And so I thought I needed to be what I saw. And so I went to school and I continued to fight. And it was, it was extremely traumatizing to the extent that the people that met me during that time, they really didn't get the full me. Like, I feel like now that I'm working on healing and I'm working with other girls to help them identify different triggers to help you that, that trigger your different emotions, now I am the person that I need to be and the person that I should have been, but I didn't know who that person was at the time. So, you know, what, what society doesn't teach you is that you don't know how to apply what you're learning or what you what has traumatized you to your life to help you overcome those issues unless you actually talk about it and work with people who have overcome those obstacles so it's like you go to a doctor and so for me i just had twins and the biggest thing about that was that i had to leave my daughter justice and need you and so my doctor he tried to give me um depression pills and i said well i'm not depressed I have a child in NICU and I don't know what to do. I've never experienced that. I said, do you have kids? He said, no. I said, well, how can you help me? Mm -hmm. So that, that whole thing relates to that. If somebody has never been through it, they can't help you apply the life skills that you need to help you overcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, uh, Dewan, thank, thank you, Dominique. And, and, and 
Uh, as Bob said with the younger panelists, we're also here with you always. Uh, and we'll continue to uplift uh, up, up the voices of all of our young people and people that have uh, parents that are incarcerated. Uh, one, one to kind of shine a light on, on Dewan a little bit. Uh, Dewan, uh, could you share with us, uh, uh, you haven't been able to celebrate also because of COVID-19, but you just did what? Uh, what you mean, like graduated high school? Yeah, you were sharing that with us. Like, you, you graduated, that's right. That's that's the easiest part, but I just got to send it to Alabama and them and I've decided to go there in the fall. Whoa, so, this is, Thank uh, you. So, so, but you said what? So, so, so in terms of how, how I, I'd like for each, like school is, is super important. Education has always been, uh, my, my mom always told me how important education was. And education will definitely take you wherever you want to go in your life. So I'd like to hear from you, uh, Casey, Sunshine, and James. What is it like, like achieving things? Like I know James plays football. What is it like making these achievements but not being able to have your parent uh, that's incarcerated be there for those, those, those great successes that you experience through life? Were you asking me that? You, you, and, and you, and then after you, Casey, Sunshine, and, and, and James. Um, it just like you said, like what, like how did that affect me? Like my dad not being here while I just graduated and stuff like that, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. But um, it it just really hurt for real because it's just like he didn't get to see me. You know what I'm saying? Graduate from middle school. You know what I'm saying? He didn't see me get to graduate from high school. So it's like, I mean, I'm doing it for him, but it's also like. Yeah, I can do it for you, but I also want you to be there with me to see me do it physically. You know what I'm saying? I did completely. I'm not going to say I just did perfect my high school years, but it had been some fall offs. You know what I'm saying? I had to pick myself back up by myself because of my dad not being there. So it was hard on um, not even just me, but just, you know what I'm saying, everybody, because I got to still keep my grades up and still do good in school and stuff like that. But also, you know what I'm saying, make sure I'm doing good and stuff like, like that at home. So. It was really hard, but I did it. You know what I'm saying? That's all I can really say. Like, it was motivation from him because he didn't want me to be like that. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, he's already in a place, you know what I'm saying, where I don't want to end up. So it's like, you got to keep your head on straight and keep going. Thank you, Duan. I'm doing uh, uh, Casey or Sunshine, would you like to share education and achievements that you've been able to achieve? Uh, what is that like not being able to have, like, uh, uh, your dad there to, to share those, those successes. Um, did I freeze or did I? I can go down. Okay. Okay. Um, it make me want to keep going. Like sometimes I won't give up, but then like he always remind me to keep going and like keep going to school, keep going to work. Like no matter what, because my education is everything, and that's gonna get me to where I want to go in life and like he always remind me to keep going to school and keep doing the work like pushing myself and so like he's even though he's still even though he's in prison like he's still parent from prison by like verbally like he just tell me like Casey you gotta do it and because I love him so much and like he really like my best friend like I'm like all right I gotta do this so he helped me a lot. Motivation, huh? Yep. And I just can I just chime in and say, like, these young people really keep us so inspired. Like, I can speak on behalf of like Karen and Dominique. I know it. Like, the strength and the courage and your ability to speak up for yourself, like, is so inspiring. And it's helping us heal as well, right? From the things that we've experienced through our experiences. So I just want you guys to just continue to just shine as bright as you are supposed to. You guys are so beautiful. Thank you. Oh, it's my turn. Yeah. Um, in my case, I actually graduated a year early from high school. And um, I graduated at 16 years old from Shawman High. And it was like very, very emotional. Because just like Miss Dominique, my first time seeing my dad outside of prison, 
it was for my grandmother's funeral, actually, his mother. And I just remember asking, like, why, why he have to be, why his feet have to be handcuffed? Like, I was very, very young. Like, why, why they got to treat him like that? And nobody just, act, everybody just act like they didn't hear me, but I really just wanted to know why. Like, it's his mother's funeral. He's grieving. Like, what could he possibly be trying to do? And for graduation, it was like I tried to put on a show. Like, nothing was really bothering me. But the whole time, I really, really, really wanted my daddy to be there because I just felt like I had achieved something really, really great. Like, yeah, I graduated from high school, but I graduated a year early. I graduated at 16. So I felt like that was something really, that was something to congratulate. And my dad, my favorite person, wasn't there to congratulate with me. Like, it just, it didn't feel the same. Like, I just looked around, everybody else, they with their dad, their mom, and I didn't have my dad there. So it was, like, really, really emotional. And just, I just feel like if you, like, Casey, when you graduate, James, when you graduate, if y'all dead not home by then, I just feel like don't hide it, just let it out because it's going to bother you, it's going to irritate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunshine. And um, to speak on top of that, sorry, it's like let it out because ain't nobody else feeling how you feeling, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, it's your body, it's okay you know what I'm saying, to even speak on what you're going through because it's your circumstance. You know what I'm saying? There ain't nobody else that can feel how you're, you know what I'm saying, feeling. So I'm not, you know what I'm saying, when it's, you're supposed to feel some type of way if, you know what I'm saying, your dad ain't that or your mom. Cause like, for me, I, you know what I'm saying, of course, we ain't we can't have a graduation this year, but my sister, my mom was in jail when she, when she was graduating. So that made her feel some extra type of way because it's like my dad is in jail and then my mom too. So it's like, I don't really have nobody that I'm really doing this for. So it's like, she was mad, but once again, she was trying to put on the front for everybody else. But it's like, it's okay to be feeling some, some type of way because you want your parents there to see you succeed. Right. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, James? Uh, um, I, I want to say that for me, missing out my dad being here and seeing me do stuff, new stuff, like me driving, me playing my first football game, stuff like that. Um, it's very emotional and um, I don't know what the word is, emotional and I don't know what the word is, but um, he tells me to not wait for him and experience stuff on my own. And um, I try not to do a lot of stuff without him because I still want to wait for him to get out and try stuff, new stuff with him and stuff like that. And it, um, it sucks a lot that he's not here. But um, as I said, he told me to keep doing stuff, keep doing it on my own. And that's what I'm going to do. Thank you, James. Uh, so, so I want each and every one of you to know, and, and I, think, I think in this instance, I normally don't uh, speak on behalf of other people, but I feel, I personally, and, and, and I believe everybody that's listening, and, and I'm seeing in the comments, if, if you see on the chat box, there's so many people that are so proud of you all. Like you have powerful voices and we're so, so proud of you. Uh, just know that there are people, thousands and thousands of people that, that want to support and help uh, both bring your, 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 your parents home, uh, but also want you to, to excel and exceed all of any expectations that, that, that you might have. Like, like shoot for the, shoot. I've always heard they say, shoot for the moon, because if you miss the moon, you'll still fall amongst the stars. So, so like, go big and, and don't let anyone tell you that, that what you can't do. Like, uh, uh, Douglas Jessup just said, all, all of you are champions. Uh, 
Like, yes, yes, sunshine, graduating a year early is huge. And, and though, you, though your dad's not there to celebrate with you now, he will be able to celebrate with you at some time in the, in, in, in the future. You can still go out and you can still do something special with just you and your dad. Uh, so just know those things. Uh, so. Yeah, can I chime in just for a second? Because I, I just think it's perfect timing for me to say that across this country, we just have to do a better job of identifying who these kids are. They are sitting in our classrooms and on days when everybody else is happy, our kids are sad. On graduation days, prom days, first days of school, report card days, teachers are wondering why our parents never show up to parent-teacher conference. It's because we're not looking deeper, right? Like we're not really taking the time it just hits my heart when I think that we have four young people on this call today and it's pulling on my heartstrings and we are working directly with them to help them develop the tools that they need to put words to their feelings and to stay going when they feel like giving up. But what about those young people who we haven't found? Like in my city, how do I find my young people? Right, there are 55,000 kids in our public school district. We have to be identifying who these kids are. They're sitting in our classroom, suffering in silence, acting out in ways sometimes, or isolating themselves. And we're wondering why, because we're not looking deeper. But Tiffany, and I just want to say, Tiffany, you're right, but that's up to us. And so Bree and I had sat down and we had a conversation. How can we make change, not just for the girls in our group, but for all children in the state of Louisiana? And so we decided to change the laws. That's what you have to do, Tiffany. You have to change the laws so that they are identified in the state you enforce the state to identify them. So what our commission bill does is exactly that. We're asking the state of Louisiana to create a study that identifies the children who are impacted by incarceration. Because you know what? Those children are being suspended at a much higher rate than their peers are. Those children are dropping out of school. Those children are being expelled. And those are the children who are failing at a much higher rate than their peers. So it's up to us, Karen and Tiffany, to go ahead and force our legislation to make those changes because if we don't then they will always be forgotten so that's that's what our job I really is look forward to working with you on that dominique i know um like i have some i don't come from a policy background right like i'm a licensed counselor so i just understand the need but i will absolutely be like i know i i i can be the one for my city i'm just saying that on this national call where we're able to just talk yeah. across this country you know and how can we come together to make sure that like that thing that's happening all across this country and i think that's what we do we start talking about it and just like when sam is holding opportunities like this for us to talk and we allow the children to come and speak then you you, you simply you let them speak and so when they come to us and they say well hey mom and so miss um so casey will say i remember when i first met sunshine um sunshine was being taken out of school because she Googled her dad's name and it was something different than what her mom had told her. And so I helped her to identify that you weren't even having a breakdown, you were having a breakthrough because you, you didn't realize, Sunshine, that you want to be an attorney because you have so many questions about the justice system in your father's case. And the only way to fix that is for you to go to school and figure that out. But we also have to get those teachers who have never had any opportunity to work with children impacted by incarceration, then we have to help them. And let me tell you, take us, Tiffany, they, they won't be so susceptible to, to receive your help. We've had teachers tell us and principals, she's receiving all the help that she needs. We don't need you for anything. But yet and still, the girl is calling, like on a teacher's cell phone. So so, so part of the, there are two different pieces I hear here. And, and so also please pay attention to your chat box because there, there are a couple of teachers that, uh, one from LA that says she addressed with the Los Angeles Unified School District and didn't re receive response, but she said she's not quitting. I think that's definitely somebody that you want to connect with. And then Robin Myers Lee, uh, who speaks about uh, being a high school uh, teacher of many students over the years who have had incarcerated parents. Your accomplishments are huge, but building that network, one, two, uh, empowering, like people don't vote enough, understand on a local level, we control, we control our school boards. And if, if this is, if the school board is not like listening to us and changing the policy so that we can help our children to have incarcerated parents, that, that, that 
2.7 million children that, that have incarcerated parents, then we vote them out. Uh, but but that has to be a part, like policy, voting, all of these are pieces that we have to do to empower uh, our children uh, and, 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 and us too. Like we have to lead and show them uh, as they get old enough to vote, teach them how important voting is so that they can control the destiny of yeah. our communities, look like how we change those systems and make those systems uh, better. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, the, the other part is like, uh, I sent uh, uh, to, to both uh, developing, uh, despite distance, uh, uh, Place for Grace and uh, Daughter Beyond Incarceration, an invite to be part of the, the and, and I may be a little premature in announcing this, the, you will hear more of this in the next few days, the We Matter Two campaign, which will be announced as a national campaign. Uh, and, and this is something uh, in regards to our, our system and, and changing it. And it matches up almost exactly with some of the demands, the four demands for We Got Us Now. Uh, but what I, want, what I want to do last before we close out uh, is first and foremost, thank uh, the young people like uh, uh, Casey, Sunshine, James, Dewan, thank you. You, you. you young people have powerful voices know that when you speak it inspires us it inspires me uh, uh pretty much through this whole thing excuse me uh i've tried to not get emotional because i feel your pain because of my my personal experience but know that you inspire more and more people by speaking don't be afraid to speak shoot for the stars don't give up and know that people support you and always know that you have a voice. And as long as we're able to, like, we're gonna create these platforms for you. Eventually you'll have your own platforms, step up to them and let people know like this needs to change. Uh, in closing, I'd like to ask uh, each of you, uh, uh, if you want, if you could ask people out there to just do one thing this week and, and, and I'll end the one closing, uh, one minute, on closing thoughts, and what would you ask people to do uh, that are listening? Um, like, just like um, Ms. Dominique was saying about the school system, I went to a school where no outside counselors were, were able to come in. There were only the school counselors that were able to talk and discuss stuff with the children who they consider were bad or that were acting out and i was one of those kids like i always did have good grades in school always did good good did good in school but i was always a fighter and nobody never asked i think we might have lost why. Y'all can hear me? Can we hear you? Yeah. Sunshine? Yeah, I don't know what happened. But no one ever asked me why was I acting out. It was like they just threw a counselor on me. And this counselor asked me the same thing every day. How's your day? What, how your grades are? how you and your teachers doing and it's like he didn't know what was really going on with me because the school didn't dig deeper my teachers didn't dig deeper but as a counselor i felt like he should have dig, 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 dug deeper and that didn't happen because they don't know what we go through because they haven't been through it and i just feel like how could you play somebody that didn't go through what these children went through in the school system, only for them to just ask you the same old questions. The same, I went to, to see a counselor twice a week. It got to a point where I didn't even wanna go. Like if they called my name on the intercom, I didn't even get up because you're not helping me. And I felt like I needed help by somebody like Ms. Dominique or Ms. Bree like somebody that actually been through what I've been through in the school system, and we don't have that. Thank you. Case, case, uh, closing thoughts, anything that you want 
the people that are listening to this to, to know and to do? Um, I just feel like if you know somebody that's going through something or like they probably not even going through something, they probably already been through it. I feel like it wouldn't hurt if you really care about them for you to just check on them. Like, because one thing for me is I really love to check on people that I care about, but then <clears throat> I also love when people check on me. Like a lot of times Miss Bree or Miss Dominica text me and asks me, hey, what time you get off of work? Or hey, what time, you know, you gotta go to work today? Or, like, I really like that kind of stuff. And I know other people will feel like, you know, they're more loved and they're more cared about. Like my father don't always get to check on me. And like, I don't really talk to my mama. So when it comes from other people, it make me feel like at least I'm getting it from somewhere. So if you really care about somebody and you know something going on, like reach out to them and see like how they day going or something. Thank you, Casey. Thank you so much. Dewan, uh, last thoughts, anything that you want the people that are listening to, to do or, or, or that you want to share? Dewan got disconnected, unfortunately. He's, he said he could still hear us when he called back. Um, but if you could circle back to him in a second, I'm having him text me his final thoughts. Okay. James, anything you want the people to hear, any final thoughts, speak from the heart, know that we're, we're like, we got your back. We, we, we right here with you. Man. Um, watch y'all know that, um, <laughs> that it's, I don't know. Hey, I don't know. Okay. I don't know what to say. It's all right. It's all right. Hey, listen, it's hard. It's hard. I, but but also know that, that you inspire. You inspire so many people, that, that all of you inspire so many people, okay? And know that we're here with you. Uh, Tiffany, did, was, was the one able to text you his final thoughts? Okay, so um, he wanted to say that he was happy that he was able to connect. Really good feeling to be able to hear about everyone else's experiences. But you know what? I wanted to bring in one of his points from our, our call from yesterday. And that was around um, like the mistake, right? And so I think he talked about that. And, you know, in our country... I, and I kind of want to tie this in with my ask, right? I think what I would like is for people to shift their perceptions um, and to understand that individuals that are incarcerated should not be judged forever on that mistake, um, that they belong to people who love them and who are thinking about them each and every day. Um, so I think I just wanted to say that, that um, individuals that are incarcerated in this country are our mothers and our fathers and they matter to us. And we, we're not just throwing them away and forgetting about them. Thank you, Tiffany. And, and so, so I wanted to ask both you, Tiffany, and Dominique, as, as uh, uh, though you're adults now, you were once children with, with the incarcerated parents, like any last thoughts that you wanted to share to uh, Tiffany and Dominique, Dominique from that perspective of a, of a child with an incarcerated parent? Um, so for me, I want to ask people to be conscious when they are thinking about these children and just any child in general. Before you say what happened, ask them what's wrong. Um, before you say, why did you do it? Ask them, are you okay? And do you have the mental capacity to discuss what just occurred? You know, don't just always assume that the child act out, acted out for no reason, ask them what's wrong. Are you okay? And Tiffany, to go back to what you said about identifying them, we could always tell some children who are neglected um, and are not just receiving the attention that they need just by their physical, the way that their physical appearance is sometimes. Thank you, Dominique. Yeah, so I'll just echo that and just um, want to say like, just open up your eyes. If you're an educator, you work with young people, look deeper. Um, 
care, open up your heart. Just to thank be a resource. You. Thank you. So, so thank you all for joining us this week for the fire, for ARC's fireside chat. We will continue to lift up the voices of our incarcerated uh, uh, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, like uh, the people that are incarcerated, they're human beings, and we will continue to uplift their humanity. Uh, uh, in closing, uh, if there's just one thing people out there can do, just one thing, uh, donate to our partners. If you look on the screen now, uh, please reach out to them, donate to them, reach out to them, connect with them. Please take a moment to write down their information. Uh, Daughters Beyond Incarceration is on right now, Place for Grace, Developing Despite Distance, and We Got Us Now. Uh, please take a moment to jot down the information. If by chance we take this down before you have a chance to get all of the information, reach out to us, send us an email at ARC. We will get their information to, to you. Uh, check on another thing that you could do, just when we talk about one thing, something simple. Check on the young people in your life, in your neighborhood, in your classrooms. Ask them how they're doing. Like build those relationships and let them know that they can communicate with you. Uh, stay in touch. Stay in touch with them. Like one of the things uh, that I've learned through mentoring is that, that young people need consistency. Uh, always stay in touch. Always be consistent with them and, and, and take time to listen. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for, for uh, uh, joining our panel, for sharing. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you. I think you're super, super powerful. Uh, and next week, uh, join us again for our fireside chat. Uh, if you have other questions that we may not have answered, please email us at antirecidivism.org. Uh, we're here. You can find us on the, on the internet also. Uh, we'll continue to build this national network in order to empower our young people. Thank you, and everybody have a blessed day. Thank you. Sam, I followed you on Instagram, so you got to follow me back. I'll follow you, okay? I'm going to check right now. I'm going to check right now I'm just to follow you on Instagram. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you.